sponsored by the James Madison Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Hello and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Jo Livingston and now I'm so excited to be here with who I can see, Raven Leilani and Kristen Arnett to talk about their books, Luster, that's Raven's wonderful book, and With Teeth, um, which is Kristen's wonderful book. Um, please to learn more about our authors, check out loc.gov forward slash bookfest. Um, before we begin, now that we've begun, I want to let you know that we're going to save the last 10 minutes of this conversation, uh, of this event, to respond to audience questions. So um, you can start submitting your questions now. Um, now, the theme of uh, this year's festival is open a book, open the world. Um, and this is a pretty, it's a capacious question, but I'm excited to pose this to our two authors here today. So maybe we can um, start with Raven. Open a book, open the world. How have books opened the world for you? Oh my gosh. Um, well, for me, I think books primarily were uh, a form of escape. Uh, I came up in a really uh, a religious context. And so the first books that touched me were <laughs> like books that were titillating, you know, books that felt like private, um, exciting experiences. Uh, and, and they were, it was a, it's a kind of privacy um, that I feel like it's the first, one of the first privacies you enjoy as a child is you in that story. Um, and after every book, I always had this, you know, this feeling of, of wanting it to continue. And that was how I, how I began writing. I wanted to, I continued it in my own way. <laughs> to continue that privacy almost with yourself as a reader. I like that. I like that. Um, Kristen, how have books opened the world, world for you? I am going to agree with Raven on this. I think it's, um, it's one of those things. I grew up a uh, in a very evangelical household um, as a young queer closeted person um, and books were something that I felt like I had to hide all the time. Uh, my parents were very much uh, in control of the kind of things that I read. So when I had like opportunities or teachers or librarians um, to give me material outside of, you know, what I was normally allowed to access, it felt mind blowing. It felt like, um, like, just uh, things breaking open in ways that I didn't think were possible. And it was also where I first began to understand my queerness and, and who I was as a person and how I moved through the world and that I wasn't, there wasn't something wrong with me, that it was like, I felt myself um, there in those books. So in, in ways of like escape and also ways of like just feeling like known in a way that like quite often I felt isolated and and like I, I wasn't known by anyone and books really provided that and the people who gave them to me, like those teachers and librarians, this way of feeling seen, which I think is really important for everybody. I just want to say, like, I, I fully feel you on, like, the kind of resident librarian that made you, you know, <laughs> I definitely had that, you know, I, so I want to shout out, um, I want to shout out the librarians that kind of see you when you're coming up and, and, and show you this book, this book, you'll love this book, and that you discover yourself through that. Yeah, it is. It's like, uh, um, it's like the people that are like, right, like the kind of people that are like, let me let me help you find you, yeah. which is delightful. <laughs> Do either of you remember the title of any particular books that you remember, you know, being handed to you, someone saying, I think you're going to really like this. And then any any particular like titles just spring to the front of your mind? Uh, my, the book that I felt like that happened like that for me was um, Dorothy Allison's Bastard out of Carolina. That was a book that um, was given to me in like a library space and I took home and read and was the first time I felt like, I was like, I see myself here. It's like so much about like, cause it's a book that's like a, about queerness but it's it's not like talked about in that way. It was like a character who I felt I like deeply resonated with. And it was like so much about place. And I was like, this is a person who saw me thought of this book and was like, you're going to like this. And that was a book that, that's the book that made me want to be a writer. Because I was like, I can write about these things. I didn't think that I could. It's okay to like write these kinds of things. And I was like, my stories are interesting and there's space for them. And so that was definitely the book that was so important for me in becoming like, not only who I am as a person, but who I am as a writer, I think. I think like in hindsight, perhaps this is like an inappropriate book. 
<laughs> to, to give a budding reader. But I, for me, it was like, I started with Anne Rice, you know, like those really kind of sexy vampire texts that like, for me, were a safe place to begin to explore, you know, the erotic. Uh, so I think that that was where I started. Those were the first books. So it started with Anne Rice and then Laurel K. Hamilton and then Darren Shan. And, in those sort of magical contexts, it was a, a, it felt like a safe place to explore what excited me on the page. I love that idea um, that you, I think you both said the word magic at some point, right? The, the kind of special alchemy that happens to you and you alone. Um, now for people, people who have read your books, um, both of your wonderful novels will know that both of them do this a fantastic job, I think, of focusing on exactly that moment of uh opening up of a domestic or a or a home or a private space that um a character perhaps is never expected to access or somebody comes in who you never expect to be there how um I feel like I could just say anything about writing an intimate you know and an, a kind of intimate um a, a domestic space like that is there any like tips to make a home seem like a home I don't know that was a bit of a mess of a question but I think you know what I'm getting at I feel like as I was writing Luster like one of the kind of um the core v like motors of the of the book is that she's trying to find she's trying to cobble together something that feels like home enough where she feels the safety enough um to make things and so I think that like it's a book about art making and to write about art making, you have to write about the place you feel safe to make art. Um, and I think that what it ultimately sort of affords her that space is the, um, you know, due to the kind of um, like systems uh, that she's working with and the home she has sort of collapses and she has to find another place in order to, to find that generative energy. And in that place, she finds um, a sort of mentor um, a person who takes her seriously. So I feel like in that context and in, in some in personal context, um, uh, the domestic making a home, having one, having that safety, a place to rest um, is, is crucial, has been to me and, and is in the book, is a crucial kind of aspect of having the kind of um, bandwidth to make art. I love that so much. <laughs> oh, um, a safe place. I, I'm a, a big fan of, first of all, of Luster. I think it's an incredible book. I think it's like doing so much about talking about, yeah, it's incredible. Um, I, I am like a person who is like obsessed with the domestic. I think anytime you're looking for stories, um, then families come to mind because that's so much of like how family whatever that family is made up of like you know is it like a found community is it like parents and children is it like siblings is it you know like a grandparent and a child like what does that look like um the backbone of many families is like the stories that are told inside of the household and so much of that to me is like really interesting because I think that it makes it so that pretty much everybody in a household is an unreliable narrator because <laughs> everybody's telling the same stories but like in different ways because we all have main character syndrome um but with with Keith I was really thinking about the idea of this kind of unreliable narrator situation and I was really excited to think about because I'm less interested in like the big moments of like queer family and more in like the the daily lived experiences of like just moving through the world like being like I'm a queer mom and I'm you know, taking the garbage out. I'm a queer mom and I was late to work. Like I'm a queer mom and maybe I'm not a very good mom. Like maybe I'm bad at this and I don't like it. And I was like, I'm really interested in seeing the ways in which people fail. And we like, we can sit with that failure. Um, and when I'm thinking about like, just like who humans are, like and the, just the mess of them and how they struggle and try and fail continuously. That's like a thing that I really wanted to have with this book was like a person who, you know, is an uncomfortable person and not a great mother and she's queer. And this is like the daily lived experience and how these kind of like um, little ways in which dysfunction kind of add on top of each other can like 
you know, the last little piece, like kind of wreck a household or like undo a household and show how it fails or can fail. And that felt important to me because I think the, the failures are just as important as the successes. And as a queer person, I want to see the whole like gradient scale of, you know, like the, the triumphs and like, you know, being laid low. I want to, I want to see all those things. So that felt important to me to write in the book. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I, now that I'm thinking about it, there are so many parallels between both of your novels, you know, kind of really neat inversions. Um, but, but, but both of you do uh, this, I think, as you said really well, that um, Kristen do the sitting with failures within the kind of nuclear family, the traditional, you know, kind of immediate family unit, failures to do with... Um, and not failures like anybody is to blame, but kind of, right, failures of structure, failures of narrative um, going on between children and parents. And I thought that the child-parent relationship, it seems it's so difficult to come up with anything new, but I think the, both of you really threw new challenges <laughs> at um, a set of adults, especially when it came to children. <laughs> um, and I like that. I like that. How, um, how do you feel about putting characters that you have made up, you know, that you have brought into the world, putting them through the dark and the difficult um, experiences? I've always wondered that. I think that, um, <laughs> I mean, I have two minds where I feel like you, in, in order to, to sort of do, tell a story well, you have to have a, a certain amount of distance, distance enough to be cruel, um, but then because I was telling this story um, in which there are, I mean, it is sort of a pylon, it is like a kind of accumulation of pressure and I'm writing a story of a black woman and of her striving, you know, toward, you know, trying to make her art, trying to find intimacy. It was important that there be places in between where um, that pressure was, um, uh, was let out where there'd be moments of joy, you know, along with um, the the angst. Uh, so for me, <laughs> I mean, psychologically writing it, reading it, and and what I owe the you know the characters um, that I put there, I, I wanted there to be you know truth because that's that's always what you're trying to do is to tell the truth, um, and that's the truth is that in between like those moments of human drama. And almost and occasionally at the same time, which is, I found like a really absurd kind of part of life is that along with that, there is joy. They kind of happen all at once. And so that too was important to me. And uh, Kristen, like I, I noticed that in your book too, that like as she is sort of grappling, uh, you know, with these uh, like sort of ambivalence around motherhood and like the sort of overt and even covert violence <laughs> that happens between her and her child, you know, like there's the care, there's like, if I can quote, um, there's this moment where she is aware of like the heat of the seatbelt <laughs> and, and is careful. And then there's the moment there she bites <laughs> her child. <laughs> and I love that those two moments exist together. And in between there's pleasure, you know, there's, there's sex and there's joy and there's gratification, you know, that too, I could feel that balance in your text. So that is very nice to hear. Um, Cause it is one of those things and I completely agree with you. Like the way that you're talking about, like how you write those things, like, right. Like the idea of having distance, like enough from it that you can be a little cruel. But I also think like too, like we get, to, we get to know these characters more than anyone else does. We sit with them the longest. And I think sometimes it's, it shouldn't be this way, but I think the people that we know best, we can be the cruelest too because we know their weak spots and you know getting to these characters and things i i think like the idea of like having these little levels of right because we don't like the emotions don't exist inside of a vacuum um right so like the idea of grief or like pain and trauma um there's like simultaneously like right like joy and also like humor and things because um i mean we just we make these like decisions and move through life and at times they are absurd and I think that that was a way that I was thinking about a lot in writing with teeth because I was like this is a book about discomfort I started comparing it to that feeling of sitting at a bar 
and you're overhearing something next to you and you realize it's like the worst date you've ever heard somebody be on, just a horrible first date, just the worst. And you're sitting there listening to it and of course you're continuing to listen. Um, but you're like, oh my God, thank God that's not me. And But then at the same time, you're like, well, that's been me before. There's these moments in which like, it's a relatable thing to be in a, in a moment of discomfort. And I think we can find humor in it from being able to be like away. Um, but I think like with like any kind of emotion, there's like ways in which things are funny, especially after the fact. I, I know in my own life, it's been like, well, at least that's a story <laughs> for later <laughs> that I can tell. But it's, um, I think it's, it's one of those things where it's like they, they have to go side by side. Those things happen, or like what Raven, what you're saying, like they happen like simultaneously, right? Like the joy and the and the you know the pleasure and the pain, they happen sometimes. They go hand in hand, um, and that's what's fun about I don't know, like diving into like the human condition. It's like right, like kind of like scrambling your fingers around in a brain and seeing what you pull out. <laughs> that's a beautiful way to describe it. First, but a good metaphor. Um, <laughs> Both of you are making me think of uh, the Shirley Jackson's letters that I recently read. Um, it's just come out in a collected volume and she's kind of the queen of finding the Gothic um, in the domestic, right? And finding the, um, the things that are more spooky or more frightening because they're lurking behind the texture of everyday life. Um, and I loved, but reading those letters and thinking about the kind of gothic domestic um because gothic art is all kind of funny right like it's all a little bit like absurd and there's an element of camp and there's well a, like a large element of camp like going back to Anne Rice Raven right so um I I love the idea of the absurd and the terrifying occupying a place in inside the home Right, and that having some relationship to the absurd out, outside of the home. Again, not really a question, just a feeling. <laughs> um, now we have a question, which is actually, I'm gonna go to a little bit early because it's kind of a big one because I'm really curious. So I want you to talk about it for the rest of the time. So um, we had a question from um, someone called Jack who was saying both of your current books feature personal intimacy in close quarters. Absolutely, you know, a feature of what we've been talking about. Um, are you planning to write anything out of the pandemic? Had a working lockdown experience. Um, you know, obviously we're here in this different context than we are usually, but um, yeah, has it sparked anything in your writing practices? Well, um, I don't, I haven't, um, I haven't, I haven't, and don't think I will be working on anything that like sort of directly relates to the pandemic. And, and that is partly because I, I really, really struggle with writing about a thing when I'm still in a thing. You know, I, I feel like I'm, I know writers who are the exact opposite and have, and I envy them deeply um but for me it's it's the distance thing again like I need I need distance and coldness I think to have like real control over my words and even have the language you know I feel like I'm waiting I'm waiting for the language um if it ever comes but I will say that because um there we had really no choice but to kind of operate um in the sort of midst of uh, kind of global chaos um, it has changed my practice in that I have, I have sort of changed my, um, my kind of ideology around writing, um, writing through a thing as writing is processing. And so I am working on a new book now, and it is, it is the sort of closest to the bone I've ever written. And it is a deeply uncomfortable experience, but I, I feel like from that moment, I, I realized sort of my ability to kind of lean into it sooner than I normally could. Huh, interesting. Okay, so you, in kind of like, in theory, need that coldness and that distance, but if you once, now that you're actually like putting your shoulder to it, right, it's like yielding. Yeah, yeah I'm a, I don't know, well, look, I'm not, a, I'm not being interviewed here, so I don't have to say. Um, Kristen, how about you? <laughs> Wow. Um, I, I completely agree with you, Raven. Um, I think I'm a person too, that it would, 
not saying that I never want to say I don't want to write about something because first of all I'm like such a contradiction in that as soon as I tell myself no to something then the other part of me goes well now I'm gonna do it like so I'm gonna do that but it's it's one of those things where it's like I I do agree that like I I don't I feel like I know the least about something when I'm the closest to it it's like so mirror that I can't make out like what it actually is or what I think about things I need time to ask the question the right way this is what I like think about a lot in terms of like librarianship also and I really think it applies to me for writing as well is quite often in any kind of project I'm working on but specifically something book length it's um like a like a novel um it's less about like what the concept is and like I me trying to write the book and trying to figure out how to ask the question the right way and so I think I, that takes a lot of time to get to like whatever that thing is um so I, I think I just would need more distance from it I my practice has changed too and some of it is like myself as soon as I feel like I understand anything about myself like as a person but also as a writer because those things are like right inextricably linked with each other um then that thing changes so it's kind of happened with like every single book that I've written is that the practice changes and how I how I work um daily but also like in terms of operations like Mostly Dead Things was different, a different practice and process than putting together with teeth and the new projects I'm working on now. First of all, I'm so impressed with people who were even able to work in any kind of capacity for like the last year. It's only within like maybe the last like five months for me that I've been able to work. And I keep comparing it to, I'm really being very beautiful today with my, how I'm talking. I keep comparing it to like finally being able to like throw up. So it's like, I'm like, let's just get it all out right now. Um, so, and, and see what it is. Cause I've been so happy to just be able to write. Like if, even if it turns into not being like the thing, the right question, I'm happy enough to just have a question out there. So I think practices like have changed for me in that kind of way, which is that I'm just allowing myself to kind of sit with my word vomit <laughs> lovely <laughs> good I'm so, I'm so happy for you that you finally threw up Kristen <laughs> good. we have a question from um CCA I hope I said your name right um what has it been like um you know to turn from the process of composition under these strange circumstances um what's it been like you know finishing slash release releasing whatever that timeline was, um, your novels into these, this, this new world that we're living in post-pandemic? Well, I would say, I mean, since um, I debuted in that year, I, I have no, no, no other reference points. It's, it's sort of what the only thing I know. Um, and there is a, there's a sort of, like the, the beauty of it is that I could kind of uh, reach more people uh but I do I do miss being you know in a room full of people that kind of human energy that feedback is is different and um I think it will be like in a few days that I, I actually read for the first time um here uh in, you know in the states um in a room full of people and I, and I really look forward to that you know because I I do think that it is just um it's one of it was one of my favorite things. Even when it was me, I was kind of just attending events. I, I really love that that feeling of being in a room and and listening um, to a person read and feeling that sort of that communal energy and focus. Um, but it is it was it was deeply surreal. I mean, it was it was deeply surreal. Um, and again what I was talking about before, I feel like I'm still looking for the language to describe what it was like. Um, but more than anything, I'm just, I'm just grateful that um, we were able to find a way to kind of still connect. Yeah, it's, um, this was, my first book was uh, my debut in, in person. And so this was obviously a very different, um, like a, very different, but I, it's so, as a person who like I I started writing like my my first book like mostly dead things came out I was like 38 you know like I was like I I didn't I I met a lot of like writer friends like online and from Twitter and like kind of virtually like meeting people and like talking about like I didn't go to an MFA program um lived in like central Florida like for pretty much my entire life uh so it's like we had like some arts things but it's like not being like around like so it's like for part of me is was like kind of used to this idea of like we're like writing and events feel far away but we're connected through this kind of medium um 
And I love that. I, I deeply miss being with people in person because I love just like the idea of like, you know, afterwards, like kind of unpacking everything out of the bar or over a drink or over like a, you know, just like a basket of like shitty fries or something um, and talking about like what that thing was and feeling that kind of connection and the humor and energy that like Raven was talking about, like in her room, even like attending as like a listener, like and, and listening to somebody read or talk about craft or art in this kind of way. It's really energizing. And you take that energy out with you into the world. I miss that. But there is something that's so wonderful about the accessibility of being able to be in a space that's so far away to see like a beloved author um, and hear them read or talk with like or even just being able to like for myself be in conversation with people that I, I wouldn't have been able to do that with previously um, and and feeling a connection in that way and having it be accessible for people who wouldn't have been able to go, even if it had been in their city for like, you know, just like, you know, for people with disabilities or people who don't have the funds to get someplace or people have to work all the time to be able to watch a recording. And so for me, it's been like, I just love the idea of like, at least like marrying these things in the future and having them touch. Cause it still is so, I think it's so important to be able to have those things. So that has felt really good to know that if there's like an event of mine and people wouldn't have been able to come in the past that they can definitely just like log in and show up or even watch a recording of it later. And that seems, that seems special in a way where it's like um, a bit different kind of specialness. Um, but I, I just <laughs> am greedy and want to experience both. <laughs> right, right. There's something about the placelessness of this um, type of communication that we are doing right now as we speak um, that has, as you say, this kind of special quality of its own, that the no place is equally accessible, but some place <laughs> right, can, can, can become harder to get to. And we have a question here um, from Anna T who asks, you've both set your novels where you as authors live. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, how important is place to you both in your writing? Well, we have two and a half minutes and uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what does place mean to you, Raven? <laughs> oh man, I mean, it, it was sort of just the way that it came out. Um, I feel uh, for me, for me, what is really exciting is that, um, is that aha, this moment is that sort of familiarity that you, you know, come across in the text. Like there's nothing better. Well, I mean, yes, maybe there are things that are better, but one of my favorite things is to open a book and realize I'm standing on the street that the book is talking about. And it, occasionally that happens. And it, in a sort of um, less literal sense, that still feels really good. And so as when I write place, it is, it's me sort of trying to manufacture that feeling that I love encountering, not to, you know, I also do like to encounter a place that I, I've not encountered uh, and to feel the strangeness of it, the newness of it. Um, for me, um, I just wrote towards those details. Uh, you know, I wrote towards what sort of roots me here. And, and so it was here in, in Brooklyn and it was upstate New York. And when the book came out, I, you know, I, I grew up in a, a small town upstate. Um, I got letters from from people who grew up in that town that remembered that dead mall, you know, like, and that was why, right. <laughs> that was one of the reasons why I, I, I wrote, um, you know, toward the kind of specificity of that place. Because um, I do think that that is like, it's just a really kind of juicy thing to kind of, that recognition is is one of the more exciting things I feel when I read. Thank you. Kristen, come on, you got 20 seconds to talk about place. God. I consider myself to be a place writer, um, specifically about Florida, and a big part about, I'll just kind of condense, this is my elevator pitch about Florida. I wanted to write about place through like a sensory experience of my own like personal experience moving through like a lifelong Floridian of like what that is and especially central Florida and bring that to people in a way that they would connect with it outside of their preconceived notions of Orlando and also to feel that they might not have been there but they feel like they've experienced it or that they've been there before and that felt important to me and I love place writing yay <laughs> well thank you Florida I've only ever visited through your fiction thank you both so much for joining us we're out of time sorry if we didn't get to your question um thank you so much this was wonderful so lovely to meet you and enjoy the rest of your day <laughs>